Hello and welcome to the 11th meeting of the Welfare Reform Committee for 2015. Could I start by asking everyone to make sure that their mobile phones and electronic devices are on silent or at least switched to airplane mode? Um, today's meeting might be slightly shorter than we had originally intended when we uh, began the agenda for it, and that's because we'd originally hoped to invite uh, Atos and Salas to appear before us today, but we couldn't uh, arrange that in time. Uh, but we have planned for them to come in front of us on the 23rd of June. But that means that we can go to our agenda item one, which is uh, a discussion with the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, who's always willing to come in front of us, I'm glad to say. Um, so I welcome uh, before us uh, Alec Neal, the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Communities and Pensioners' Rights, Jamie McDougall, Head of Social Security Policy and Delivery, and Edward Orr, Senior Policy Officer, Social Security Policy and Delivery Division. So I'll pass over to you, Cabinet Secretary. Do you want to make any opening comments? I'll, and then I'll make we'll a, have a, discussion. a few brief ones, uh, convener. I'll keep them brief so that we can get a chance for a, a wider discussion. But uh, thank you very much indeed for the opportunity again to come in front of the committee. I think a lot has happened, actually, since uh, the last time I appeared in front of the committee in terms of the welfare powers that are to be transferred to the Scottish Parliament. And can I say right at the beginning, um, and I want to emphasise this, and as I did at the last meeting, that we're about to begin a, a consultation process and what to do with the powers and how they fit in with existing powers and so on. And I'm very, very keen to ensure that this committee is involved in that consultation as a key participant uh, and that we work together in all of this because I do think if we can get a consensus in the parliament on the way forward, once the powers are transferred and how they fit into existing powers, I think that would be beneficial, not least to the people who are reliant on uh, these benefits for their uh, well-being and their standard of living. Uh, can I say there are real challenges, I think, that we're all aware of ahead in terms of taking forward the powers from the Smith Commission, the challenges associated with austerity and dealing with the consequences of the UK government's welfare reforms. And Particularly, obviously, um, there is a budget now, emergency budget schedule for the 8th of July, when at least some of the £12 billion of additional reductions in the welfare budget being proposed by the UK government, hopefully some of the detail of that will become clear and what the impact will be on the powers specifically that are to be transferred uh, to this parliament. Obviously, we don't know the details of those cuts at the present time. We haven't been consulted about them. I would hope that we would be consulted, but uh, I suspect not. Uh, and we are particularly concerned about the impact on women, children and people with a disability, because we believe these are the three categories of people who have been particularly adversely affected by the reforms up until now. Uh, but obviously, again, we'll be interested to hear what the committee has to say about the additional reform stroke cuts and what impact they will have uh, and how you respond as a committee uh, to that. Um, there, as you know, been recent research from Inclusion Scotland and the Scottish Government showing the very real fears people have about welfare reform. Uh, last week I wrote to the UK Government setting out their concerns on the £12 billion and on the future of the Joint Ministerial Group about the transfer of welfare powers uh, and I'm happy to update the Committee on progress on these matters. Uh, there have already been a couple of meetings uh, with the UK Government to discuss the transfer of the new powers prior to the general election but progress has been a bit slow since the general election and indeed I have a planned conversation with the Secretary of State uh, this afternoon to try to agree a way forward to reconvene the Joint Ministerial Committee on the transfer of powers. Clearly in the UK government there has been a change of personnel. Uh, the Secretary of State was the Minister of State, although I believe he's going to continue along with myself to co-chair the committee. But there's been changes at DWP and Treasury personnel, so uh, that needs to be sorted out about who's going to represent the UK government, and then hopefully we'll reconvene fairly soon and get on with the job. Obviously, since the general election, the Prime Minister and the Secretary of State have both said that the Scotland Bill will implement the Smith Commission recommendations in full. We believe that the Scotland Bill, published on the 28th of May, falls short in a number of key areas. Uh, apart from modest changes to the welfare provisions, the policy reflected in the bill is pretty much identical to that published in January. But the unanimous report of the Scottish Parliament's Devolution Further Powers Committee concluded that in some critical areas, the UK government's draft clauses fell short of the Smith recommendations. 
It's extremely disappointing that so little progress has been made in the four months since the draft clauses were published, despite a range of constructive suggestions and engagement by the Scottish Government. We have, for example, drafted and shared with the UK Government a full set of alternative clauses on welfare, which would have implemented the relevant Smith Commission recommendations, but these have not been included in the Scotland Bill. The Scottish Government will continue to press the UK Government to amend the Bill to ensure that it reflects the substance and the spirit of the All-Party Smith Commission. Greatest priority at the moment is to ensure that people have the opportunity to have their say on these new, as we prefer to call them, social security powers. Uh, I value uh, the work that's being taken forward by a number of organisations, including this committee and NGOs, in relation to that. And I think that um, if we can discuss in detail the consultation process, um, either here or offline, to make sure that we're in being inclusive and the committee is satisfied that we're including all the key stakeholders, including and in particularly those who are or could be uh, recipients of benefits, because it's how they're affected that matters more than anything. Uh, a lot of work is going on behind the scenes to prepare for the new powers. Officials have met with a range of people and organisations from the UK government, devolved areas and wider field, and much more still obviously remains to be done. Uh, however, um, I do believe that we will, by the end of the year, hopefully have a much clearer picture on what we want to do with these powers, hopefully on a consensual basis, and not just looking at these powers in isolation, but looking at them in the context of all the powers that the Scottish Government will then have in relation to social security and how we maximise the impact of those budgets and powers to benefit the people we're here to serve. Thank you, okay. Convener. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, one of the, the important reasons why we invited you uh, here today is that we, as you know, committed uh, earlier to have an inquiry in the autumn into how additional welfare uh, powers promised uh, under the, the Smith Agreement might be used in practice. Uh, for example, how the new uh, PIP would operate and uh, other uh, areas. Um, at the time, you thought that that was a good idea, uh, but you've just made it clear just how fast things are moving and, and how quickly uh, you might uh, see some change taking place. So do you still think that our uh, proposal to have an inquiry in the autumn will serve a purpose? I, I do actually, Convener, because um, I think there are a number of issues here that will need to be fleshed out and will actually not necessarily be fleshed out by the time we get to the end of this calendar year. Because once these powers are transferred, you effectively have two welfare social security systems operating in Scotland. We will have the social security system being operated by the Scottish Government and the social security system being operated by the UK Government. Now, the interaction between those uh, is extremely important. Uh, for example, I'm very keen that we try to get one delivery system for both systems so that people are not forced physically to shop around and can find it much easier to find out what they're entitled to, whether it's a Scottish government programme or a UK government programme. Secondly, the decisions and policy of one system will have an impact on the other. Uh, one example is carer's allowance. Uh, we are keen to increase the level of carer's allowance to equate to the job seeker's allowance. But a consequence of that with universal credit is that any additional money that we give to carers will be treated as income under the Department of Work and Pensions system for universal credit. So uh, the imp that's one just small example of where decisions in one system can impact uh, what happens in the other system and it's a net effect for, in this case, carers that we need to look at and there needs to be a degree of coordination between the two administrations on an ongoing basis. So that I just pick these as examples of the kind of issues I think that this committee, almost as a watchdog uh, role, 
in looking at how the new system uh, or the new ways of doing things are implemented and looking at their impact, I think over a period of years probably, there's a watchdog role for this committee to look at how the two systems are operating, what the impact is each on the other, and particularly what the impact is on the end user of the services. And that's in addition to the policy issues. For example, uh, at the moment, as you know, we've asked for two things in relation to PIP, which you mentioned, Convener. The first is we think it would be sensible to stop the rollout of PIP at the moment throughout Scotland because we don't want to roll out PIP and then very shortly replace it with something else that we agree would be better in Scotland. And that would mean that these beneficiaries, these disabled people, would have had three different systems operating probably within the space of about three, three or four years. I don't think that's very clever and it's very expensive. But secondly, the budget for PIP is likely to be reduced under current plans by 20%. And we have been arguing that um, the PIP should be transferred before the budget cut um, so that we can then decide, uh, do we want to continue with the current planned levels of um, benefit for PIP or others, is there some of that better, it can be better targeted to more disabled people, for example. So these, these are examples of the kind of issues I think that this committee needs to be heavily involved in. So I actually do think there's still merit in an inquiry, maybe a slightly different remit from what was originally envisaged. Well, that, that's helpful, uh, Cabinet Secretary. I, mean, I know that you watch the, the uh, work of this committee uh, closely. And you'll have seen from last week's evidence uh, in relation to our inquiry into the impact uh, on women of the social security changes, um, the example of the, 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 any increase in carers' allowance and its impact uh, because of universal credit. But importantly, um, some of the, the contributors last week started to talk about what they wanted to see happening uh, with the powers and also in relation to how they um, interact with current uh, powers and, and policies. And I was just wondering if you'd given any thought to uh, anything that you heard last week in relation to how um, our, our current system of uh, support for women um, through the services that are currently provided uh, can be enhanced or, or progressed further with the new powers that, that you expect us to have. Well, there's no doubt that women, children, and particularly the disabled, have been particularly impacted by the welfare reforms and cuts. Um, and I therefore think that uh, we, how we address that situation is a top priority. However, one of the things I'm determined not to do is to preempt the consultation that we're about to launch before the summer recess. Uh, and I think it would be wrong of me to do that because I actually do think we want to listen to what people are saying uh, before we actually start to comment on whether you know one, one particular option is better than another. Uh, the one thing I will say is that whatever we do, we've got to give priority to trying to improve the situation for women, children and the disabled because they have been particularly adversely affected. But I think at this stage, if I start providing a running commentary on every new idea that comes forward during the consultation process, I think that would be unfair to the people who are making a contribution. I think my job at the end of it is once we've got all the, the feedback is then uh, with my officials to go through all of that and then come forward with a set of proposals which hopefully can gain consensus. But we are monitoring very carefully what people like last week, what, what is being said and the ideas that are coming coming forward. I mean, one, one of the, as well as the actual benefits and the targeting of benefits and the level of benefits and the regularity of payment of benefits and in the case of housing benefit to whom it is paid, all of these issues are extremely important. But the other thing is how the benefit system actually delivers its services, because there's no doubt in my mind at all that one of the major problems for people is just the sheer number of benefit centres they're dealing with. I, I mean, I think I mentioned the last time I was here, in one case I actually sat with a constituent and dialed six different benefit centres and was then referred back to the first one before we actually get a solution to the problem. Now, that cost me about seven pounds or eight pounds in my mobile phone, uh, which you know I get paid in expenses. Um, but 
somebody who's on benefit, if you're on job seekers allowance and barely getting just over seventy pounds a week, you can't afford six or seven pounds on your mobile phone to shop round benefit centres. So that's a, a kind of example of the kind of thing I think if we take that kind of aggro out of the system, we'll be doing everybody a big favour. Yeah, um, I'll open it up to <coughs> members of the committee to ask questions if they want to. Kevin, do you want to go first? Um, thank you, convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, last week, uh, we had a number of organisations uh, around the table, um, and they expressed an opinion that they'd uh, like to see the sanctions regime devolved to the Scottish Parliament, uh, and in particular, uh, a number of folk highlighted the disconnect between devolving employability uh, programmes but not the conditionality and sanctions regime. Um, is that something that you would support? Would you support their view? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think the sanctions regime, as it's currently administered, is very harsh, it's very inhumane, and I think it's causing enormous poverty and causing people to get into debt that could be avoided. Um, the purpose of the sanctions regime is to... Um, punish, if I can use that word, people who are not genuinely looking for a job. Now, let me say right away, I have no truck with people who try to defraud the system or who try to manipulate the system and don't play by the rules. I, I think, you know, I've got no sympathy for those people whatsoever. I think they then bring the whole system into disrepute and that's not beneficial to anybody. Having said that, the number of people in that category, I think, is very, very small. I think the vast bulk of people who are on benefit are genuinely in benefit because they can't find a job or they're not fit to work. Um, and I certainly, in my uh, experience, and you know, I spoke to people on universal credit as well in Inverness, and the reasons for some of the sanctions are absolutely absurd. I mean, I've seen people sanctioned because they were a few minutes late for an appointment. I was actually told uh, in Inverness, uh, under universal credit, you've got to either spend 35 hours a week on a computer looking for a job or 17 and a half hours looking for a job and 17 and a half hours volunteering. Somebody was threatened with sanctions for volunteering more than 17 and a half hours. I mean, that's an absurdity. Uh, other examples were, um, that, you know, somebody going for an appointment, I think, at the job centre, and at the very last minute, the babysitter couldn't make it. As a result of that, they couldn't make the appointment, phoned up and explained the circumstances. They were then sanctioned. And what happens when people are sanctioned, they, first of all, their money is cut off, and in most cases, they're not actually told their money has been cut off. They only find out when they go to cash their money at the bank. Um, and that then is for an initially for an indefinite period. And, you know, the number of people I've had at my constituency surgeries, and I'm sure everybody else is the same, who have then got into enormous debt and even going to money lenders in order to make ends meet um, has is very significant indeed. So I, I think the sanctions regime needs, as it stands, to be completely scrapped. I'm absolutely in favour of saying to those who refuse to look for a job for no good reason that, you know, we're going to deal with them uh, and, and we're going to, you know, take action to try to ensure that they do look for a job. But I think the extremities of this sanction regime are extremely damaging and actually, ironically, at the end of the day, possibly cost the public purse more money than it saves because you end up with people who become destitute who then require local uh, services in terms of housing or the social work department or welfare rights or a range of other services. And I think if you did an exercise, you'd probably find in certainly a number of cases that uh, by sanctioning these people for entirely the wrong reasons, we actually cost the public purse more than we save. Um, I visited uh, Aberdeen Council for voluntary organisations yesterday um, and their cash in your pocket team uh, were uh, giving examples of, of difficulties uh, round about that sanctions regime. Uh, and I think you're right that it probably costs more to do it this way um, uh, and the state has to pick up all of those additional costs. One of the things which was said is that we have a situation where folks are sanctioned. Um, often that sanction is overturned, but by that time the damage is done. Um, another debt is accrued. Um, folk will get their money back, but they won't get any interest in that money. 
Um, how do we ensure that a system that we set up, if we get um, the, the powers over um, sanctioning as well, which I, I hope we do, how do we ensure um, that we create a fair system? Well, first of all, can I say at this stage, I'm not optimistic that we will get the powers over sanctions uh, because certainly as things stand at the moment, the indications are that that's not going to be the case. Um, but I, I think, the, the, first of all, you start from the basic. Now, the, if, if you look at the policy of the Department of Work and Pensions, and I've spoken to the head guy in this, uh, the policy is that the people who are sanctioned are the people who are genuinely not looking for work not people who genuinely couldn't miss an appointment because the babysitter couldn't make it or who were genuinely late or for other very good reasons couldn't turn up. Let, let me say the first thing I would do is abolish the targets that DWP officials have for sanctioning people because I think that's driving a lot of the inhumanity in the system. I would comp The first thing I would do is abolish those targets. Uh, but secondly, I would enforce the rule that the only people who are sanctioned in any way are people who are genuinely not looking for work. And you, you, give, them, you give them the opportunity to, to correct their behaviour. Now, when, when I say the word sanction, I, I wouldn't be a sanction as, in terms of immediately withdrawing their money and not telling them their money is withdrawn, because you've got to look at the consequences of that. And as I say, the consequences could be far more damaging uh, than uh, is currently the case. I think the previous situation where um, people were, as it were, warned, they got a warning, uh, sometimes they get two or three warnings, and then at the end of that period, when they absolutely refused to do anything, that's when action was taken. And I think that would be a much more humane system, while at the same time making sure that people genuinely look for work. But I think it is fair for society to say, if you're not going to <coughs> look for work and you're fit to work and you're just going to abuse the system, then we're not going to allow that to happen. But at the same time, <coughs> you can't punish that person's kids or their, or their spouse because of that. So you have to be very careful about how you do it. You have to be humane and you have to be proportionate and it has to be effective. Um, so I think the previous regime, which uh, before these sanctions, the current regime of sanctions was introduced, the previous regime was closer to what was a better system than the existing system. So you're talking about no targets, which I think this committee would agree with. Uh, the DWP, of course, deny that there are any targets, but uh, we have plenty of anecdotal evidence that there are. Um, and you're talking about a more personalised service tailored to the individual and what's going on in their lives. How can we have that personalised service um, if there is that disconnect between employability services, which we are likely to get with the transfer of powers, if we don't have the control uh, over the sanctions part as well? Well, we've made it very clear. I mean, my, my view, leave aside my position on the Constitution. <coughs> Just from a practical point of view, it seems to me that the <coughs> current suite of powers being transferred is wholly inadequate. You, you either transfer the whole suite of relevant powers uh, or, or you end up with the kind of mess that we're in danger of ending up with, with two systems which can actually end up contradiction and under, contradicting and undermining each other. Uh, and sanctions, you know, is a very good example of that. So my view is that, you know, all the welfare powers should be transferred to this parliament. If it's good enough to have, you know, the ones that are being transferred, if you apply the same logic to the other powers, then logically they should be transferred. Uh, and that would avoid a lot of the problems, I think, that are going to arise under the current proposals which I've already mentioned a number of them, uh, and it would allow us also to tailor the social security system in the way we want uh, for the needs of people in Scotland. Uh, because clearly, um, we, I think, it's fair to say, we do things very differently. And one of the ways in which we do things differently, I think one of the problems, you know, is, <clears throat> let me give you three practical problems people genuinely looking for work have. Number one, finding access to a computer for 35 hours a week. A lot of people in these uh, low-income groups just don't have access to a computer and it's very difficult to get access to a computer in many areas, particularly in rural communities, for 35 hours a week. 
Uh, secondly, as I said earlier, they're dealing with people that can't even see eye to eye because they're dealing with these call centres all the time. And I don't think personally there's any substitute for you know an eye to eye contact uh, with people who've got problems with their benefits. I'm not saying you have to do that every week to pay out the benefit, but people who've got problems and uh, they they should be able to see someone and talk to someone. And the third thing is, in the moment we've got. <coughs> a very divorced system between the people who are responsible for administering benefits and the people who advise clients on what benefits they're entitled to. Now, I personally think we should look at co-location uh, of the people who administer the benefits with the welfare rights organisations uh, because I think then you would get much more rounded service. People wouldn't need to shop around and we could get, I think, a bigger bang for the buck in terms of the money we're spending on welfare rights uh, and, and more people uh, assisted. And I think it would prevent a lot of things going, a lot of claims going to appeal, for example. Uh, the, you know, problems could be nipped in the bud much quicker if there was co-location. I'm not saying the same person, because I think it has to be two separate people uh, and two separate organisations, but if they were co-located so that you could check there and then with welfare rights that what you've just been told is right and you're getting everything you're entitled to, then I think that's a quite a preventive measure in terms of preventing problems. And it's one of the areas I personally uh, want to look at is the co-location of these services. Thank you very much. Thank you, Convener. Okay. Uh, clear to be followed by Christina. Mm -hmm. I thank you, uh, Convener Cabinet Secretary. Um, if I could just turn to the issue of the impact on children. We took a one-off evidence session on the effect of um, in children's services budgets of the and, and what came through was it was a sanctions regime, low paid work was put in incredible pressure on families, there was increase in mental health in families. And we also took evidence from Bernardo's last week who said that instead of in the GERFEC context of being able to do early intervention and work with children, um, that they're much more likely to be dealing with crisis at the moment, all, all to do with the, the push of the savings and the DWP being pushed out to other services like the third sector like social services, like those other areas. Um, personally, I think it's morally reprehensible that we're sanctioning anyone who has a child to look after. But I just wondered if um, you, you and the Scottish Government are considering doing any substantive work on, on the cost to society, the more general cost to society, the effects of not being able to do that early intervention work for young people and the effect that poverty will have in the long term in Scotland. But in various parts of the government, we're constantly doing impact assessments and evaluations. And of course, we also rely on outside organisations who do their own work, uh, <coughs> provided they're reliable and respectable organisations. But what I'll do is I'll ask Jamie just to give you an indication of some of the work we're actually doing or will be doing and have done in terms of looking impact assessments of policy changes? Um, as the Cabinet Secretary said, um, we've got various studies going on, um, which I think you've seen recent reports on about the, the impact of the current welfare reforms. Um, these will be updated when we know more about the scale and where the um, 12, further £12 billion pounds of cuts will fall. Um, but I mean, these are um, long-term, long longitudinal study, studies and a lot of the impacts they're not clear straight away exactly what the impacts they have, and some of them are much longer term. I mean, that these are um, apparent with the sort of limiting up rating um, type of cuts, so it might not be apparent very um, quickly, but over the long term, the more that you keep down and limit up rating against inflation and everything else, it, it, it becomes increasingly worse. We're quite happy to send the committee a list of the studies that um, are being un undertaken by both by ourselves and by other parts of the Scottish Government, at, which you know are, are affected um, by this policy area. Thank you, okay, Christina. Thank you very much, Convener. Good morning, Ca good Cabinet morning. Secretary. Um, I wanted to um, pick up on the point that my colleague Claire Adams has just made and extend that a wee bit. We heard from a number of organisations and, and a number of organisations within this committee and out, out with the committee, but have fed into this whole. Um, 
debate, uh, close the gap, Fawcett Society and gender, pe people like that, who have talked about the gendered barriers within the current system. Now, you and I, Cabinet Secretary, have fought a long and tiresome battle in Lanarkshire for equal pay for some of the people that work in our local authorities, most of them women. So I just wonder whether the, the Scottish Government have taken what cognizance they've taken of gendered barriers and whether they're taking any action to try and break down those barriers. Well, it's very much at the forefront of all of our thinking. As you know, the First Minister has given heavy emphasis to the need to ensure a gender a fairness and balance and equality. And we will apply those principles rigorously in any policy development that we undertake in relation to this. And we, you know, any... But, you know, we're looking at the evidence. You've had some of the evidence in terms of uh, gender barriers. We'll look at ways in which we can break down those barriers and have gender equality, um, because clearly um, there are areas where um, women um, are not, you know, always treated uh, as fairly as men. Um, it might, in some cases, be attitudinal. In other cases, it might be just in terms of um, how. Uh, some of the benefits are being applied, but whatever the, the, the barriers are, we want to break them down. In fact, that actually uh, would make a very useful addition to the remit of the inquiry the convener referred to at the beginning, is to make sure that any new system we're introducing actually tackles the gender barriers and, and takes them down and makes sure we get equality between men and women in terms of how the whole system works. Yeah, Cabinet Secretary, I, I really appreciate that. The, the um, figure that we have in front of us is 85% of all welfare reforms are impacting on women, and especially women with children, um, and women who are either out of work or in low-paid jobs. And there's two aspects of welfare reform that I want to uh, discuss with you. One is the benefits cap, which I'll come back to. But the other one is universal credit. And one of the things we hope from Smith is the devolution of universal credit, but the administration of universal credit. And one of the real concerns of that, especially maybe in households where the woman is low paid, maybe with um, you know a situation with domestic violence or things like that going on in the household, where the, the universal credit would be paid to the one householder. Would there be any room within a Scottish system, should you have that power, to ensure that it's the key person and not just the man that gets paid um, the universal credit? I mean, that would be a fundamental principle of applying equality, um, that you wouldn't automatically pay it to the male uh, person in the household, that you would pay it to whoever was the appropriate person. Um, now, you need to define the appropriate person. I mean, one of the benefits, I think, of child benefit, as introduced by Barbara Castle all those years ago, is that it was paid to the mother. Now, that was positive discrimination in favour of mothers, <coughs> and it was done for very good reasons, because the evidence showed that <coughs> in a lot of cases where the male member of the household picked up the child benefit, the child and the mother never saw it, you know, in many cases. So that, <coughs> that was done for very good reasons. So there has to be very clear indications of when and to whom you pay it, under what circumstances. I mean, the three immediate changes to uh, universal credit we've asked to be able to make as soon as possible, are number one, just to formally abolish the bedroom tax in Scotland, because we're paying for the abolition anyway, so we might as well abolish it. Uh, again, I actually think probably if there was an exercise done, the bedroom tax is probably costing more public money than it's saving, because it costs about... Twenty-four to forty thousand pounds, depending on the circumstances, to make somebody homeless. So, if one person becomes homeless because of the bedroom tax, that's a lot of bedroom taxes eh, for a lot of people. The second major immediate change I would like to make, and we've asked the, for the flexibility to do so sooner rather than later, is uh, <coughs> to allow people to be paid f a weekly or fortnightly, and not just monthly. Uh, now, I don't think we're going to be, with the way the computer systems have been set up, I don't think it's probably possible to do it weekly. No, but it's uh, long term, but tw twice monthly. Twice monthly. Um, so fortnightly, basically. Uh, because I think people are finding it difficult to manage on a monthly basis, especially if they've been used to weekly payments. Uh, and the third uh, immediate flexibility is to pay the housing benefit directly to the landlord. You know, under the old system, 96% of housing benefits were paid directly to the landlord, and the number of people who get into trouble because of a non-payment or a into debt because of non-payment of their housing benefit was tiny. 
Um, and I think, I think everybody's agreed it was a far more sensible system than what we've got now. Um, and I think, to be honest, I think the Department of Work and Pensions is beginning to roll back itself a wee bit on this policy of trying to... Now, I know it's been done for, the, for good intentions to make people responsible for their own actions. That sounds great in theory, but in practice, a lot of people are getting into debt because they're using their housing benefit payment to pay for other things, which is perfectly under feed the family, buy shoes or whatever for the for the kids for school and all the rest of it. So I, I think, you know, going back to the system whereby you pay it to the landlord, unless the, the beneficiary actually explicitly exercises their right, as 4% did under the old system, that they be paid directly. OK, thank, thank you for that. I think I just that want would to, be beneficial to women as well, by the way. Yeah, absolutely, I agree with you. I, I just want to turn to the, the benefits cap. And last week I asked some questions around about the, the proposal to reduce the benefits cap even further um, and how that then impacts on low-paid women. So it's, it's women that are in you know, the minimum wage jobs, that um, are having to work around about the school day, who are having top-up benefits in order just, just, just to survive. And I had noted last week that Lord Kerr in the, the Supreme Court had ordered a judicial review of the benefits cap on the impact of, on children of having you know, adequate food, clothing, warmth and adequate housing. Um, I wondered whether you, you welcomed that judicial review and given you know, my addendum to that question last week was about the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child a possible withdrawal from the ECHR and the Human Rights Act and the ability of anybody to challenge the system in that, that respect but when we get to a system where the fundamental needs of children are not being met how can we remedy that? We, we can't continue mitigating a bad system, so how can we remedy the system that it supports young people in that way? Well, well, that's my point. It's very difficult for us to remedy or to mitigate it because, quite frankly, we don't have the resources to, to mitigate it and, of course, we don't have the powers to override the decisions of the UK government in these matters. Uh, so that's another reason why I would like to see all of these powers transferred here because I think we would take a much more humane approach uh, to these matters uh, than is perhaps the case. I mean, in terms of the cap, um, and I can understand, again, the rationale for a cap, but um, the cap is a very crude, uh, very, very crude um, instrument, uh, and I think it's got unintended consequences, or maybe intended consequences, which are damaging to the most vulnerable sections of our society. So I personally would not apply the kind of crude cap we have at the present time. I have to say that a much better system was what we used to have uh, in this country, uh, which was earnings-related benefit. And that was that's the same in most continental countries, where the amount you're paid in unemployment benefit or sickness benefit is earnings related. Now, there is a cap on it because if you're earning 200 grand, you're not going to get the same share of 200 grand as you are going to get of 20 grand if you're earning 20 grand. But actually, the earnings related benefit system that we used to have in this country and which is fairly common in the continent, in my view, is a far better approach uh, to dealing with these issues than kind of crude uh, instruments like CAPS, which I think uh, satisfy a lot of headlines, but actually have a lot of hidden consequences that are very damaging, particularly to children, the disabled and to women. So do you used to support the judicial review and would you uh, be against any withdrawal for the ECHR? Human well, rights? I mean, our Absolutely. government policy is very clear in that. We're yeah. utterly opposed to any withdrawal from the convention or any backtracking on the Human Rights Act. OK, thank you very much. Convener. OK, thanks, uh, Joan. To be followed by Margaret. You'll be aware of uh, reports in the, the Guardian this week that David Cameron has refused to rule out cuts to disability benefits um, and said he's not going to make any more further cuts to, to child benefit. What implication does that have um, for Scotland? Well, not just for Scotland, it would have a huge implication right across the UK for disabled people. I mean, the level of poverty amongst disabled people is far higher than the general level of poverty amongst the general population. Uh, and if you look, actually, since we're talking about, you know, welfare to work, it's key to all of this uh, policy uh, being driven. Um, the 
likelihood, the ability of disabled people to get into employment is about half uh, the chances of the broader population. People with learning difficulties have only about a quarter of the chance of getting into employment that the general population have. So these people are very, very disadvantaged uh, in life. Now, we've got to try and rectify those disadvantages, uh, particularly by getting them into appropriate employment and reasonably well remunerated employment. But until we can do that, they should be uh, entitled to a good standard of living under the benefit system. It's not their fault that they're disabled. It's not their fault they're finding it extra difficult to get a job. It's not their fault that um, you know they're having to rely on the state uh, for their entire the entirety of their income. Uh, now, I think I, su I suspect the way in which this is going to be done is not by reducing the disability benefit, but possibly by taxing the benefit. Um, and again, you know, I would have thought that that would be very. First of all, I don't think it'll raise much revenue if, if the tax is fair, because there are very, very few disabled people probably uh, earning enough or good enough of an income to pay tax in the first place. Um, but secondly, again, tax is a very crude way of doing it, because the reason people have these disability benefits is because it's based on need. They need more benefits than, you know, say, somebody who's simply unemployed but not disabled because you have additional expenditure, you have additional living costs if you are disabled. And clearly the current system where you've got maybe higher levels for mobility and care and lower levels, that's designed, that in itself recognises that people have different degrees of need. And therefore to start to undermine that, I think again would be a very regressive step. Thank you very much, and I, I totally um, agree that people will be affected right across the UK. I think the, um, uh, the tenor of my question was that given that some disability benefits are going to be devolved to the Scottish, uh, uh, Scottish Government, given that, as you've identified, that the, the talk is of taxing disability benefits, what are the implications for us if we, you know, if we mitigate um, some of the, or try to improve the benefits for dis disabled people? the UK government could then take away that through tax? Well, again, that, we would need to be very cognisant of that because there is no point in us paying out money that then lands back in the Treasury in the form of income tax. Uh, so we would need to try and design a system that avoided that happening while at the same time maintaining the standard of living of the disabled people we're trying to help. And in terms of uh, the vetoes um, which the Devolution and Further Powers Committee um, have, have highlighted, how, how, um, how concerned are you that those vetoes will stop you doing exactly what you've, you've outlined there? Well, I'm very concerned because I think, quite frankly, um, Ian Duncan Smith has fought this tooth and nail, and if, if in law he has the power to veto, my view is he'll use it. I think Ian Duncan Smith would use the power to veto. Um, and therefore, we want to see in the Scotland Bill the power to veto completely removed so that there is no huffing and puffing, there's no dubiety about what the law states. They should not have the power for a devolved responsibility, they should not have the power to veto full stop. And we would expect, hopefully, that amendments will be carried during the course of the passage of the Scotland Bill to rephrase and hopefully to substitute the relevant clauses for the clauses that we have already suggested to the UK government and which disappointingly had not been included in the Scotland Bill that was, uh, that was published last week. Thank you very much. Okay. Margaret, before by Annabel. Convener and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, in your introductory remarks, you mentioned there'd be two separate social security systems in Scotland if this goes ahead. Will there be a, an interface where it would all come together or, you know, a simplified forum where, you know, you wouldn't have to fill in separate forums and uh, because we're already hearing uh, lots of evidence around the, how difficult these forums are to complete. So I just wondered, has there been any work done around that? and what your view is on it. Well, we have agreed in principle uh, in the ministry, Joint Ministerial Committee with David Mundell that at no time during the transition or thereafter should anybody who's reliant on benefits um, lose out in any way um, or have any 
a period during which they're not paid benefit as a result of the changes we're making. Uh, I absolutely think it would be common sense for us to um, have a system whereby at a policy level we consult each other before uh, finalising policy to look at the impact or unintended consequences the a policy decision by us might have negatively or otherwise on the social security system operated by the UK government and vice versa for them to consult us on any policy changes before they make them so that we're absolutely sure that we are not um, making decisions that uh, then very quickly might have to be reversed because of unintended consequences. And similarly, I think, we, as I said earlier, we need to make life easier for the claimant, not more difficult. And therefore, it seems to me not just co-location between the benefits administration of the Scottish system and co-located with welfare rights. I actually think the UK system, the Scottish system and welfare rights should all be co-located so that people have a one-stop shop they can go to and get whatever benefits, whether it's a UK benefit or a Scottish benefit or advice on their welfare rights, just all in one uh, location. I think that would make life a lot easier for these yeah, people. I mean, I agree with you on that. I suppose what I was trying to get to was that would it mean there'd be two separate computer systems where we've heard in the past about, you know, when there's different systems set up and then the computers don't talk to each other. So would it still be the same computer system even though the actual security uh, benefits would be different? So that, you know, they're only filling in the one form and that can go in and then they don't have to fill in another one if they're claiming a different benefit, um, which is actually administered by the UK uh, DWP. Initially, uh, during the transition, it will be exactly the same computer systems and we have officials talking to each other uh, about that. But clearly, if we decide to redesign some of these welfare powers and why get them if you're not going to make them more effective and more efficient and more targeted at the people who need them, then clearly, through time, there will be changes that will need to be made. But I think... It shouldn't be beyond the wit of us or the Department of Work and Pensions to make these changes in such a way that there is no uh, detriment to the claimant uh, and we're not making life even more difficult for the claimant. I think if there's any difficulty with that, it should be behind the scenes rather than the claimant having to worry about the, um, the difficulties. I don't know if Jamie wants to add to that. Yeah, if I, if I may come in, I mean... Um from our um, work with DWP so far, I mean, what's become clear is the current social security system is not connected. So all the different benefits that people claim don't talk to each other. There's situations where you have to phone up to get a form sent to you, which you fill in, which then gets sent somewhere to be scanned in, to be sent back to the same place, to be then entered manually into a computer system. To then for that's That's common across different benefits. It's not a system that's currently well connected so I think taking that as a starting point um, and then adding in our own systems there's a lot of opportunity to, to improve how those uh, benefits operate. Okay. I mean a good example is uh, I had a constituent in to see me two weeks ago uh, who had been claiming her husband has developed dementia and she put in a claim for disability living allowance which is a 40 page application. Um, she got confirmation from the DLA centre that they had received the application form, but because of his age, had passed it to the PIP office. So she didn't hear any more from the PIP office, so she phoned the PIP office and said they hadn't received it from the DLA office. And she said, well, could you phone DLA? They said, no, you have to phone the DLA office manager. So she phoned the DLA office manager and the DLA office manager told her, no, no, it's the PIP office manager she had to phone. So she phoned back to the PIP office manager and basically ended up with her having to completely resubmit the application and they were denying her the benefit from the date when she submitted the original application on the grounds they had no proof of it. But they did because the DLA had confirmed it. So I've now ended up writing as an MSP, to Ian Duncan Smith, saying that this lady should be paid the PIP. They've been awarded PIP, but not from the original start date. It should be backdated to the original start date because it's, their system is a shambles. Mm -hmm. Total shambles. 
Yeah, I mean, that's the kind fact, of... the whole system ev- yeah, is shambolic. It's kind of evidence that we've been getting uh, when, uh, in the past few weeks. On um, sanctions, where, you know, if you're being paid through universal credit, that will include your housing benefit. So if you're sanctioned, you lose your housing benefit. Is there any plans to extrapolate the housing benefit from uh, universal credit? Well, we actually, I think, agree with the Labour Party in this position that uh, housing benefits should be kept separate from universal credit. I think one of the reasons why universal credit is proving so difficult uh, to implement is because of the complications of including housing benefit, uh, quite frankly. But at the moment, the UK government's position is that housing benefit will remain part of universal credit. And uh, I think, you know, I mean, there was a report yesterday in the, the Observer newspaper of um, a report which I think has been published on Sunday, a, a report being published by the Resolution Foundation saying, and another body saying, actually, they're going to have to redesign universal credit. Otherwise, as it stands administratively, it just is unsustainable. Mm-hmm. It is so shambolic. In there, I, I don't believe housing, the housing element can be sanctioned in universal credit. Um, I think the risk is, is that if you receive your universal credit as one package, you don't distinguish between what's the housing element, and if your job seeker's allowances disappears, then what's remaining, you choose where to spend it. But I think technically the housing element shouldn't be sanctioned. Oh, well, we'll uh, but, check that out. But again, the consequence of that is that... Uh, People, A, might not understand that um, if they're sanctioned, and they then end up spending their housing benefit on day-to-day living, and thereby, in those circumstances, and thereby getting into debt and all sorts of other problems. So it's another example of where, as things stand, it really is unsustainable, in my view. And, you know, just on this, on sanctions, where uh, we've heard about lots of examples of, you know, you've had them as well, it's the inconsistency across the country and how these are actually being rolled out and how they're affecting people. So, on training, have you, you know, the Scottish government going to increase that? Is it looking at improving the training of individuals who are actually uh, dealing with the public and their claims, particularly around appeals? There seems to be lots of uh, different assessment on people's well, you know, their actual health conditions. They don't seem to be properly trained on how they deal with that. Well, that. That would be part and parcel of looking at the delivery mechanism we're going to use, and part of the consultation will be how should we administer these benefits. I mean, at the moment, for example, as you know, our local authorities administer housing benefit on behalf of the Department of Work and Pensions. They also administer council tax benefit as well. Um, they administer other benefits such as unif- grants for school uniforms and a range EMA and a range of other things. Uh, there are some benefits, effectively, uh, although they're not called benefits, that we implement and, and we administer ourselves. For example, through the Skills Development Agency or a range of other organisations. And then there's the new powers. So, what we need to do as part of the consultation is. I agree what is the best way to deliver this. As I say, my prejudice is to have one delivery system and not more than one delivery system to make it as easy as possible for the individual. And the training of staff, the location of staff, the recruitment of staff and all that would be part and parcel of that, taking that forward, to Margaret. But clearly, um, you know, uh, one of the discussions we have to have with the Department of Work and Pensions is the staffing issue, because if we are taking over these responsibilities, then there will be a staff implication for the Department of Work and Pensions, and clearly issues like 2P will come into the discussion, and so on and so forth. But generally speaking, we want to make sure on an ongoing basis that the staff responsible for administering benefits are trained to the highest standard. Okay, thank you. Okay, Annabelle. Ms. Convener, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Just picking up from your comments a moment or two ago to Margaret McDougall, you'll be aware of the Highland Council pilot, which is interesting in relation to uh, developing an electronic um, um, application which helps um, vulnerable uh, tenants and enables landlords to electronically 
um, submit an alternative payment arrangement. And, and that seems to be proving very positive. Is that something you would encourage other areas to investigate? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we've got to be innovative in all of this and to make it as easy as possible for everybody uh, to, to administer the system. And the more that can be done online, uh, particularly if people living in the highlands and remote areas where it'll be difficult to, and expensive to physically even go into the nearest village in some cases, let alone go to Inverness. I think we want to encourage the things that work and work well, Annabelle, and uh, clearly where they work well and there's good practice, then you would want to roll out the good practice. No need to reinvent the wheel 32 times. Mm -hmm. And on this issue which has been raised both this morning by colleagues and also emerged in evidence about to whom the payment is made... Um, the universal credit payment. I mean, do you think there is merit in a, almost a kind of social audit or social assessment of the household to try and determine who is the most suitable recipient of the payment? I, I, I think you want to not build a mountain, you know, to deal with a molehill in the sense that if you did that in every household, that would be a very expensive and laborious affair and maybe subject to a lot of legal challenge if you if you did it to that extent. Um, I think the, I, I think, however, we need to develop a kind of methodology for identifying where um, the the universal credit is paid. We kind of, if we, put, let me put it this way, we go out of our way to make sure it goes to the the mother, to the wife, rather than to the husband, for example. I mean, a, a very good example is where there's domestic abuse, uh, for example. I, I would want to make sure that the woman got the payment rather than the man in those circumstances. Um, but how you do that, I, I think, needs a lot of thought and a lot of more research before we get into the nitty-gritty of that because it's quite difficult um, to determine and could be open to challenge. The other thing is, of course, and this is always the difficulty with all these systems, and we shouldn't underrate the importance of transience. I mean, I, I had a constituency case I was dealing with yesterday uh, and the constituent has been in six different addresses, living in six different addresses in the last seven years. Um, now, that is not entirely untypical. Uh, you know, there's a lot of mobility around different addresses uh, with people involved. So I think we should, whoever system, it needs to be very robust because, and, and of course, there's transients in the sense that people move into and out of employment. They're not... You know, the status this week might be entirely different from the status next week or last week. So this is where the system needs to be very, very robust to deal with all these possible changes. So I don't have a ready-made answer to the specific question you ask, uh, other than there is going to be the need for a robust methodology for doing that. OK, no, thank you for that. I was interested in your comments about your opinion on an earnings-related benefit system. And I wondered, has any work been carried out by the Scottish Government to cost that for Scotland? No, no not in any detail, because clearly it's not in the cards uh, at the moment. We wouldn't have the power at the moment to implement it anyway. And moving on to something that is interesting me very greatly, and, and I was encouraged by your opening remarks, Cabinet Secretary, and Margaret McDougall was pursuing the point of... Um, when we have a system of devolved um, welfare provision and reserved welfare provision, your idea of a co-location, and I am encouraged by that. Am I correct in saying, Cabinet Secretary, that the Scottish Government would not wish to be deploying budget to replicating premises costs or uh, systems costs if you could in some way make that more efficiently partnered with existing services. Absolutely, and in fact, if you look at the, what we do at the present time, and I mean, the money we spend, uh, for example, on welfare rights um, right across the country, I think actually, and the money we're spending on mitigation, I mean, it's over £100 million a year. So if we can find better ways of spending that money more cost-effectively, uh, so that the beneficiary are the claimants, um, then all the better. And uh, I think... 
prevention's always better than cure. So if somebody can immediately check they're getting the right benefit from somebody who's independent, uh, if they so wish to do so, then that's better than going home and then go through a you know falderal about uh, how do you, how do you then get it rectified, having to put in appeals and all the rest of it. So I think we want to have as little money in administration as possible and as much money as possible in the pockets of the ben of the claimants. And finally, Cabinet Secretary, can I ask, is that important area being explored between the Scottish Government and the UK Government? It will be. It's not in detail yet because we're still at the stage in terms of managing the thing at a more strategic level. And then once we've got that done, we'll go into some of these nitty-gritty issues. Uh, officials are starting to talk and have started to talk about some of these issues. But at a political level, uh, David Mandel and I are still dealing with some of the strategic issues and then we'll get into more of the nitty-gritty. Thank so. you very much indeed. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. If you don't mind, I'll ask you one question just for clarification. Yeah. It's in relation to an issue that you raised around the bedroom tax. It was, uh, we took evidence on this, as you know. Um, and at the, the time we heard from local authorities, um, it chimed with uh, the, the points you made about the additional cost, um, which is being in, in, uh, incurred. You spoke specifically about the additional cost of any... Um, so the, the 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 danger uh, of increasing the cost for those who are evicted, uh, but there are additional costs in the administration of the DHP system for mitigating the um, the bedroom tax, and I just wondered, given that we'd heard that evidence, whether you had taken on board those concerns from the local authorities who pointed out that the additional cost of either finding from other budgets uh, the money to to do that or to transfer staff, which left other departments um, short of staff. Uh, have, have you given any consideration to that and there's been any discussions with local authorities how to address that problem? We've been in discussion, Margaret Burgess has been in discussion with local authorities, uh, not just in terms of DHP, but overall in terms of administration of the Scottish welfare budget. Uh, so we, we will continue to have those discussions and, you know, obviously, um, our budget has just been cut by 107 million this year uh, in the house, so we're struggling in terms of the money that's available. Obviously, we don't have a large secret uh, st stash of money that we can uh, help uh, everybody with, but we recognise we recognise in some cases there is a genuine issue there. But looking longer term, I mean, it's another very good example of where we're administering the Scottish welfare budget here, we're administering housing benefit there and council tax benefit and EME and all the rest of it. And if we can get to a situation where the administration is much more streamlined uh, so that people in, can see every aspect of all the benefits they're getting, whether it's DHP or EME or whatever, then that's where I, I personally would like to try to get to strategically because I think it would be far more cost effective and secondly, it would be far better understood by those who are able to claim. Yeah, I totally agree with you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Abolition of the bedroom tax would, would remove the administrative costs and that would be the, the best outcome altogether. Um, but thanks very much again for uh, your attendance yeah. and I, I know that you will update us uh, as things move forward and, Absolutely. and we'll take forward our inquiry uh, uh, in the autumn which we hope we'll be able to add to the, the work that's ongoing but thanks for your Thank attendance you. this morning. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I'll suspend the meeting for a, a few minutes to allow the Cabinet Secretary to leave.
Uh, the second agenda item this morning is in relation to Parliament Day in Craig Miller. On Monday the 18th uh, of May, the committee hosted a meeting in the Jack Kane Centre in Craig Miller uh, in Edinburgh to listen to residents' experiences of welfare reform. The meeting was part of the wider Parliament Day that was uh, being conducted at that time. Uh, around 50 people attended the event who had directly been affected by welfare reforms or had some involvement in the administration of support for those who were involved. Uh, and some of those who attended were accompanied by a representative of, of local support organisations. The session was organised around a series of tables hosted by members or other committee representatives. You'll see in papers that a note has been produced which draws together the output from each table and some themes that emerged overall. This document is currently being produced in an easy read version and will be distributed to all those organisations that attended for onward transmission. I'd like to give the committee the opportunity, uh, those members who were there or those who have uh, seen the report and want to uh, ask questions around what they have read about the experiences that we picked up from those who attended at Craig Miller. Um, it's one of the, the worst hit areas in Edinburgh in terms of welfare reform, and that message came through quite clearly. So I'd like to put on record the committee's thanks to all the organisations which worked with the Parliament's outreach services and their committee clerks to help support people who came along on that day. Um, does anyone who was there want to kick off, or does anyone who want to ask a specific question about the paper that that we have in front of us. Claire, do you want to I'll, say something? I'll, um, say a few words. Um, I thought it was a very uh, informative event. Um, I felt that it was a very relaxed event. Everyone seems, seemed comfortable in the setting, and I thought the way it had been put together was very good. Um, I think it was a, a mixture of experiences in the room and the table I was sitting at, sitting at had um, people um, with various engagements um, with the D DWP, with Social Security and Welfare, um, which made it very informative, but there was also um, a volunteer from the CAB who was both a, a service user, um, but a volunteer at CAB who, who was um, very well informed about some of the pressures that are coming uh, to the third sector. And some of the, the people on my table were also supportive of voluntary organisations from the area who were also able to contribute quite a bit to the discussion. So um, I, I'm not sure that we, we learned anything particularly new from it. I think it, it just reaffirmed everything that the committee has been doing on this area and, and sort of reaffirmed some of the um, testimony we've seen from people at committee about just how um, difficult um, people are finding their lives under the current regime and how nervous they are about looking forward to what impact it might have on them in the future. Yep. Uh, I agree uh, with that, that point, Margaret. Yeah, I, mean, I totally agree with uh, what's already been said. I think it really did uh, bring home just how much stress people are under. I just felt that a lot of people, I mean, I was at the same table as Heather, and, you know, people really felt quite stressed. And actually, one one of the girls said that um, she was stressed, actually, just to come along and meet us. So it's really just... You know, it just brought it home just how stressful all these uh, meetings and appointments that they've got to go through and all the hoops they've got to jump through, uh, uh, the effect it has on their mental health. Yeah. The, the table I was at was dominated by people who were support or, uh, supporting people who were going through the, the system, either uh, working on behalf of organisations or were carers for people. Um, and it was quite evident that the amount of pressure that's been uh, put on organisations to try and support those who are, are being impacted is, is becoming uh, unbearable in, in some respects. Um, not just the volume, but the technicalities around uh, what people have got to work with um, in order to try and support someone now because of the, the way that the system's administered. Uh, the amount of pressure that puts on the individuals and then puts on to the organisations uh, came through quite strongly. And we've heard that from uh, some of the, the the third sector groups have come here to give evidence um, and have told us about the impact it's having on those organisations, but to actually hear it from um, people who were working, if you like, at the coal face, working directly with individuals, gave me a sense of, of just the, the change in the pressure that's been uh, brought or that those people are experiencing. Um, so although we'd ha hired 
lots of evidence about how it was impacting on organisations. I, I think it was important for me to hear just how it was impacting on individuals who are part of those organisations, and I think that was uh, something that I took away from it. Does anyone who has seen the paper want to ask any questions about it? I'm content then that that's something that we can use as we go forward and uh, we'll get this out and circulated as widely as, as we can. Okay, thanks very much. And agenda item three <coughs> is um, our CAB visit feedback. Uh, we agreed at our meeting on the 10th of March 2015 that members would undertake visit to fit visits to Citizens Advice Bureau either in their local areas or in areas suggested by CAB Scotland. The purpose of the visits was to learn about the work of the CABs and what their clients uh, present uh, with uh, to them by listening to the experiences and sitting in on welfare benefit advice sessions. Each member visited a CAB during May and June and visits were uh, ranged from places like Easter House to Lewis and Harris. As all the visits have now been completed, um, I'd like to give members the opportunity to comment on the visit that they undertook if they think that there's something we, they could um, bring to the discussion. Kevin. Thank you, convener. And first of all, uh, I'd like to thank the folks in Stornoway um, who were very accommodating. Um, I think one of, of, of the things which really struck me during the course of my visit uh, was how uh, meticulous um, the folks at the cab had to be uh, in terms of dealing with folks and helping them fill out forms. Um, because as we've uh, heard and seen before, um, some people um, are just unwilling to tell the true story um, and always want to present themselves at their best. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you the example of one where um, a woman was asked um, if she was able to cook. And the answer was, yes, I've got no difficulty in cooking. And then the um, CAB person teased out a little bit more. Um, yeah, I can cook, but I have to sit down when I'm cooking. Um, all right, I also feel nauseous when I'm cooking. So all of this was dragged out over a period of time. Um, and the, the end scenario is, yeah, um, lady could cook, but with a huge amount of difficulty. And after the process was done, often couldn't eat because of what she had gone through. Um, and the forms themselves are extremely easy, but obviously don't tease out these things, which are absolutely vital in terms of making sure that any claim is absolutely right. Um, so uh, hats off um, to the folk at, uh, at, at the cab there who managed to tease out a whole lot more that, uh, than they would have if it had just been a straight yes-no answer to questions. Um, beyond that, convener, I think one of the things which came to light during my visit to Stornoway was the difficulties that there are in terms of appeals or tribunals which are held off-island. Um, a great amount of difficulty sometimes uh, in folk travelling to Inverness, particularly if they've got specific disabilities, which means that they cannot be jolted or anything like that during the course of travel. Um, you know, travelling across in the ferry can sometimes be a bit difficult uh, in normal circumstances. And I think there needs to be um, a real luxury, I think, by ourselves in terms of where these difficulties may arise, whether it's just um, in the Western Isles or whether that exists in Orkney and Shetland too, um, because I think that some folk are missing out uh, in terms of the service that is should be there for everyone uh, because they have these difficulties in, in terms of travel, particularly travel um, with a, a disability. Maybe we should write to to not only um, uh, the the other s cabs in the Western Isles, but also to all in Orkney and Shetland to see how often these kind of difficulties arise. Yeah, that's a good point, Kevin. I think we should try and identify that. Does anybody else want to join uh, in? Yeah. 
I attended um, the Citizens Advice Service in uh, Dumfries, which covers the whole of Dumfries and Galloway, and I, um, like Kevin, want to pay tribute to the, the staff there, who were extremely accommodating and uh, very impressive in the two interviews that I sat in on. Um, my experiences um, reflect some of the points that Kevin's already made. I sat in on an interview of a a person with uh, a severe mental illness and physical disabilities who was being transferred from um, or, uh, DLA to PIP. And uh, the, um, the, the advisor was helping her with a form. And it was very clear to me that this woman would have been completely unable uh, to fill this form in, in herself. In fact, the only reason she was there is that she historically knew this benefits advisor and because of the, her mental illness, she didn't go out and she was frightened of people that she didn't know. And it was just a, a stroke of luck for her, really, that she knew someone who worked in the Citizens Advice Service. And um, so going through the form, again, the, the point that Kevin made about people, I think people, you know, who have disabilities or, or illnesses are, you know, the general culture is to encourage them, quite rightly, to, to be independent and and, and, uh, and and take pride in what they can do. But when it comes to these forms, you know, like, they could be doing themselves a disservice if they try to, you know, say, I can do this. And in the case of this lady, you know, travelling, for example, she couldn't actually... Uh, she, because she was agoraphobic and everything, she really couldn't go out on her own. She, um, although she she was physically able to to walk to a car or whatever, she couldn't go out on her own. And similarly, even the extent of her mental health problem meant that she had to be in, uh, she had to be coached to do things like washing and cooking, eating. Remind you know because of, she had a very severe. Uh, mental illness. The other thing that I was concerned about, um, and again, which Kevin raised, I was I, I sat in in this interview in Dumfries. It was pointed out to this w woman that um, unless she got a letter from her GP asking for you know her to be treated as a special case so that she could have an interview near her home or maybe no interview at all, uh, she would just be at the mercy of having to travel quite far distance to, to, to conduct the interview. And that could have been uh, Carlisle, for example. Um, and it could have been, you know, very early in the morning. There would be no, you know, like... Um, uh, allowances according to the um, the Citizens Advice Bureau um, uh, uh, person that I was uh, with, that there would be no allowances made for the fact that there was a long travel distance, so it could be nine o'clock in the morning in Carlisle. Now this lady, there was no way that she could have done that. And what concerned me is that the the interviewer talked her through, you know, like um, gave her a standard letter for her her doctor, but she had to make, you know, she had to personalise it. She had to get it to the doctor, and the doctor had to send it off. I was concerned that, you know, given the extent of her illness, that, that that might not happen, because she certainly wouldn't have been able to fill in the form by herself. So, um, yeah, I, I think the forms are too complex, and they don't make allowances for people's particular circumstances and I've got an issue about travelling to interviews. The other interview that I sat in on um, was a completely different thing. Um, it was really an elderly lady who didn't know the benefits she was entitled to and uh, when she sat down with the advisor it was quite clear that you know like there was actually hundreds of pounds that she wasn't she wasn't claiming and this lady had just happened to go and drop in and passing. Uh, just to see if there was something she had she recently developed another illness and just to see if there was something that she was entitled to and then actually in the course of the advisor going through her circumstances with her um, it was a it was apparent that for years that she hadn't been getting what she was entitled to and it kind of um, it made me realize obviously the importance of services like citizens advice which in Dumfries and Galloway has unfortunately had a large part of its funding cut and has had to um, uh, has had to lose some of its advisors, which is really bad at this particular time. But also in terms of this eld elderly lady, um, the point that was made by the cabinet secretary about co-location of um, services, it really brought it home that you know that that lady um, had uh, had had that advice at an earlier stage. You know, she she would have um, she would have been in a much better position because she was really really struggling. So okay. that would be that's my experience of it. Okay, Christina. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, 
Well, I went along to Hamilton, <coughs> who's um, a citizen advice that I know very, very well and, and have worked very closely with her, sometimes a great support to me in, in my office. And I went along for the drop-in session, so the staff didn't know what, what was coming through the door, um, and lots of different uh, things came through the door. But there was a very untypical case that came through the door, and it, it hinged on this issue that seemed to be an issue that we've all um, identified, and certainly a number of the cases that came through the door that day was inaccurate information coming from agencies, whether it be the DWP or you know other other agencies on their behalf. So this was a, a woman, um, a, an EU national, her and her husband worked in low-paid jobs. He had had an accident at work and was unable now to work, and she had claimed tax credits, and she knew from the calculation that they'd given her too much. And she needed help to sort it out because she couldn't then, you know, see herself in debt to the government in that respect. And it was how, you know, the advisor handled that. He did went through all the calculation with her, confirmed with her, you know. And given there was a, a, not a huge communication barrier there as far as language, because the English was very, very good, you know. But still, um, uh, the, the way we would maybe describe a situation or whatever, you know, how we use language was very, very apparent that. The advisor was um, very aware of not using sort of a, some of the the lines that we would use, you know, like getting on the house on fire or stuff like that, because that didn't make make much uh, um, a difference to that person or, or their understanding. But what what really hit home for me was this was an individual, you know, who uh, works very very hard in a low paid job and now looks after her husband, who had been given the wrong information and realised that straight away, you know, and wanted help to remedy that. Um, and it's sometimes the opposite of what, what we see. You know, she was in the door saying... And, and the opposite, I have to say, from some of what the right-wing media say that some EU nationals do when they come to this country. You know, so um, that was another element to it. But um, the professionalism of the, the advisor and going and seeking all of that out and reassuring her uh, and saying, we'll, 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 we'll get this sorted, then led to a number of phone calls, which, because it was a Friday, couldn't get anybody to answer them. So, you know, he took it as far as he could at that point and the lady then was advised um, and given an appointment to come back in the middle of the next week um, to try and sort it all out. Um, so that was just a very, very unusual and untypical case. But the typical element to all of the cases I seen that afternoon was about people giving inaccurate uh, information that led to decisions being taken and being made that, that caused problems and had, had consequences. Thank you. Annabelle. Convener, um, <clears throat> thank you. I um, visited... Um, Perth Citizens Advice Bureau on the 5th of June and having driven through monsoon conditions you're going to get your tuppence worth because I um, felt the visit was not only very interesting but a, a, a report was, was justified. Can I too thank um, the three people I met who were the manager Sandy Watts, the deputy manager Christy Maguire and one of their um, professional advisors, um, Andrew Scobie. Now, what they gave me was actually a very good briefing note, so with your permission, convener, if I could just pass these round. Um, I wasn't able to meet any uh, interviewees. Um, I don't think there were any when I arrived, but one or two, I think, appeared during the two hours I was with the, the Bureau, and I think they were very reticent about having any outsider present while they were being interviewed, so I wasn't able to sit in on any interviews. Um, the first thing that really emerged from our discussions with, was geography, and I think this is akin to what you were talking about, Kevin, because you'll see from the briefing that this is a vast area, and it's diverse in character. There are more rural communities, and then there are more densely populated areas. So, for example, DWP has a presence in Perth and a smaller presence in Blair Gowrie. So that's a pretty vast area, and access for claimants can be an issue. Uh, in addition to that, um, I learned that the, PR, the PIP assessments take place in Dundee, but the ESA assessments take place in Perth. So again, geography is you know, relevant to all of this. One very interesting feature to emerge was CAB perceives DWP as having a reduced advisory role, more focused on supporting people back to work. And while that is commendable in its own right, um, the question has to be asked, well, where are claimants to get advice? Because as others have indicated, and as the Cabinet Secretary said this morning, um, the referral points um, 
and I was given a list of them, you know, who to contact and a whole list of phone numbers, um, is simply not going to be practical or affordable for many uh, claimants. And the other issue to emerge was, given that the perception is that DWP is um, performing a reduced advisory role, um, CW, CAB rather, um, proportionately is now getting a much heavier um, caseload in terms of giving advice, and pointed out that not only is there more volume, but the nature of the advice is much more complex, the issues are more complex. And the deputy manager, Christine McGuire, said something which I think is certainly worth repeating. She said, the Bureau were the icing and the cake, the Bureau are now the cake, which I thought was a very telling observation on, on how the role of CAB is changing. This led to a discussion around the claimant's um, commitment. And Perth Citizens Advice Bureau feel this should be a partnership agreement between DWP and the claimant, explicitly spelling out the obligations and responsibilities of DWP and also those of the claimant, including the consequences of breaches, so that in relation to sanctions, there is a far better understanding of <clears throat> when and how sanctions might be applied and what will that that mean. And in conclusion, just to, <clears throat> I think, reaffirm how important provision of advice and guidance is, Perth has produced its own booklet, which is very impressive. It's called In Crisis, A Survival Guide, and I've got a copy here if anyone wants to, to see it. It was a very helpful uh, meeting convener. Um, I think a number of issues emerged, both in terms of detail and in terms of general strands, and I certainly hope that the briefing note, plus what I've just been saying, will help to inform the committee. OK, thanks very much, Annabelle. Margaret. Thank you, convener. Uh, I visited the Irvin uh, CAV office, which is actually just across the road from my office, so we do sort of communicate on a regular basis. Um, I thank the, the staff very much for their uh, showing me around on the day and uh, for the information that they gave me, uh, particularly the operations manager, uh, Alan White. I, um, there was a queue of people uh, waiting to be seen when I went in, and but there did seem to be quite a lot of volunteers as well. There's four staff in total. They've got four different offices, <coughs> excuse me, including the open uh, uh, an office on Arran as well to take in the geographic spread. Uh, they also have outreach um, offices and they do home visits if required. So they, you know, they feel they do provide a good service. Uh, and they also work on a triage uh, for the people that come in. So somebody interviews them to find out what exactly their issue is and then directs them to the, the most appropriate um, help or assistant on the day. But um, certainly they're saying that the number of appeals that they're having is increased, has increased substantially. Um, and in the last two months, uh, they have seen around um, nearly half of the number of people they had seen last year. So they are expecting to see a significant increase in the number of appeal, appeals this year on around the PIP. What was interesting was that uh, on the employment side, they said uh, on job seeker sanctions that they, the numbers had fallen there. It was uh, 100 and 102, 13, 14 and 49, 14, 15. So, you know, I'm going to do some further uh, research into that as to why that is, because uh, they were concerned that perhaps people just didn't know that, you know, they could actually appeal against these sanctions. So, uh, and maybe that ties in with what uh, Annabelle was saying about, you know, there's less advice being given by uh, DWP offices. So that's something that um, I'll have my office look into uh, and check that out. But I would say that, you know, in the, the Irvine office, there, it, it's pretty much the same as we've heard already. People are really struggling uh, with uh, the changes and keeping up with the forums and just knowing what they can do and the appeals that they have. And uh, as I said, the 
I did sit in on an interview, but it wasn't related to welfare. It was to do with redundancies that um, a, a couple of the women were facing. I mean, it, but they didn't know exactly when it was going to happen. But I have to say the, the volunteer was very thorough and, the, and he was very clear as well that he didn't want to give out information that might be wrong. And he... Uh, ensured that he was going to check out uh, the information before uh, he would speak to them again. And uh, so, yeah, it was uh, it was very worthwhile and they do a fantastic job. I understand they've also had further funding from the North Ayrshire Council because they are doing more money advice uh, work as well now. OK, clear. Can I just say, before I come into the meeting, an email was forwarded to me by Perth to say they've done four pieces of research in conjunction with Stirling. Could I maybe forward that to the clerk and it can be made available to members? Yeah. I didn't have time to look at it before oh, that's, that's coming to the meeting. Clear. Um, uh, th thank you. And uh, <coughs> I can again reiterate the, the thanks to Stirling Cab um, that I was able to visit um, uh, for a morning with them. Uh, it was a drop-in se session, um, the same as um, Christina's, so they didn't have anyone lined up to see me. Um, it was just a case of um, two, uh, I managed to sit on two interviews. Um, one of them wasn't welfare-related, but it was UK government-related. It was a tax issue. And again, the, um, the scenario of phoning multiple different lines, not being put through, being put on hold, um, it was very frustrating for both the, the cab advisor and the person who had a problem, and they eventually... We're resorting to putting everything in writing because they couldn't get responses in the telephone helplines. The other one, um, it, it was, um, and I'm thankful to to the client who agreed to allow me to sit in. He was a, a very ill man, um, significant medical problems and then significant pain, and it had been a real effort for him to actually come in and um, and sit down. And it was a PIP application we were going through, which took over an hour. Um, sitting there, he himself had um, dyslexia, so he was he was confused by the form, confused as to why he needed the form, because he was in the position of having a medical condition that was not going to get any better, and obviously had been through all this process before. So it was quite quite distressing, and um, all the way through, the advisor kept saying, "Now don't worry if this fails, we'll help you with your appeal." And I asked afterwards, I said, "Is." You know, you were advising them about appeals, and she said, though, it was almost as if everything was being rejected right away. You know, that was their impression, was almost every application, um, they were finding fault with it, and people were having to appeal it, which seemed um, totally unnecessary, total um, um, over-administration in the system, that they, they were having to, to appeal so many of the applications that they indeed supported people and putting in which they felt were perfectly adequate for the um, the problems that were coming through the door. So um, I had a bit of a discussion, which is probably not relevant for here, about um, linkage with other agencies, with the council, and how they were working with the council. Um, and and uh, like all cabs, um, we're, we're under some of the financial pressures about being able to continue to provide the service they do. But it was really informative, um, fantastic um a tour of the facilities. I, I got watched through all of the leaflets that they're currently handing out to people, um, and some of the um, special works of the, the, they mentioned the the co um, work that they were doing with other cabs like Perth. It was very interesting for me because I'm not from a, a particularly rural setting. Uh, um, I, when I worked as a councillor in North Lanarkshire, I really had one cab to deal with in my area, but obviously this is a cab that does have rural issues, um, which puts pressures on their budget in terms of being able to, to do home visits and the whole capacity issues there um, for supporting people that didn't have ready access to public transport to come into Stirling Town itself and go to the drop-in sessions. So um, very much a, a similar experience to everyone else, I would say. Okay. Um, I visited the Easter House uh, CAB, um, and although, like Christina, familiar with the uh, CAB in Hamilton, Belsell, Motherwell, what struck me when I was talking to the management was the, the scale and the volume of the cases that they have to deal with in Easter House in comparison with my own area. And although I'm aware of the increase in uh, volume in my own area, um, to see that the figures that they deal with in Easter House was, was quite an eye-opener. Um, I was able to sit in on a, a PIP um, assessment 
um, and sorry, not the assessment, the, the process of completing the forum. And what struck me was that the person who was um, looking for help was himself very, I, I thought, very articulate and also very knowledgeable on his condition. It was something that he'd lived with for a long time since he'd had a, an accident at work about 20 years ago. So he was very familiar with all of his circumstances, the medications, the, the treatments and, um, and everything else that, that he required in order to complete the forum. It struck me from the initial information that he was able to give to the final information which the, the, the census advice worker was able to extract was quite marked. You know, had he completed the form himself, it would have been a very basic amount of information which he would have provided. But by the time that the, uh, the person at the CAB had, had looked into the complexity of his illness, um, the, the circumstances around his, his home life and various other things that had impacted on all of this, it was a much more detailed and complex case than it immediately looked at the outset. Um, and the amount of information which is now going to go forward to the, the assessors is marked in comparison to what it would have been had he just put down the basic information that he came in with at, at the outset. So the, the value of that person sitting for two hours taking that uh, one individual through that process might be the, the difference between them um, obtaining the, the support they need uh, and not, and I think that was crucial. Um, talking to all of the staff, the management and the volunteers, they were all uh, aware of just how much pressure they were under and how much it had changed but it was remarkable how undaunted they were by it. They just became more and more determined that they wanted to help the more people that were being impacted. And I think that was great credit to them, that they weren't um, trying to find ways of shortcutting or, or, or trying to take the pressure off themselves. They just accepted it was coming towards them and were just finding ways of, of dealing with that so that they could help as many people as they possibly could. Um, and I think that, that was to their great credit. So I'd like to thank them for giving me the opportunity to see that. <laughs> Um, to learn from them and, and to see just how dedicated they are to the, the tasks that are facing them. Um, and it sounds as though everyone's come away with a very uh, positive feeling about, I think we already had it from uh, about CAB and, and the work that Citizens Advice Scotland do in general, but to actually um, have the opportunity to see it first hand, I think is, is something that we'll all take away, I think. Kevin? Just one more point that struck me as, as Joan was speaking, convener, um, about the um, storing away situation. Uh, they have managed to come up with a partnership with GPs um, so that GPs' letters uh, and all of the rest of it doesn't cost the client. Um, and the reaction from the GPs, according to the cab there, um, is pretty, pretty good. Uh, and I think, you know, that lessons could be learned from there. Uh, in other parts of the country, uh, because if that kind of partnership was taking place everywhere, um, that would probably uh, lessen the impact uh, on some of the clients by getting all of the information right at the first attempt, rather than going to appeal. So I, I, I think that hats off to uh, the cab and to the general practitioners uh, on Lewis and Harris, who seem to, to be getting this absolutely spot on. Okay, um, I think what I'll do, I'll write to all of to Citizens Advice Scotland, but also to the individual uh, CABs to, to thank them for um, giving us their, their time uh, and, and supporting the work of the committee in the way that they did that day. I think it was a, a useful exercise. Um, so I'll do that on behalf of, of the committee. Uh, I'll bring the meeting to a close now by pointing out our next meeting is on the 16th of June when we expect to review the first draft of our Women and Social Security Committee report and also look at the work programme for the period after the summer recess. Okay. Margaret? Have we got them in our diary? Or? We had a couple. Do we want to do it? We'll I'll close the meeting and then we can discuss it yeah. in, in private rather than discuss that. Okay. So I'll close the meeting now and, and if we can have a quick chat about just how that's working out. Okay. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>